welcome you all to the module number 8 and uh, lecture number 18 of the course title psychology of emotions theory and applications so today we will be starting module 8 it's a new module and uh, in this module we will be talking about emotion based disorder so we have been talking about diverse aspects of emotions uh, the psychological aspects of emotions and in this module we will be talking about how emotional issues can lead to uh, psychological disorders. So, today we will be talking about depression as a disorder, more specifically we will be looking at uh, depression in today's lecture and the next lecture we will be talking about anxiety disorders. So, uh, just to give you a brief recap before we talk about today's lecture, in the last module was about understanding the connection between emotions and cognitions. So, we have discussed the diverse aspect how emotion can influence cognitions and also we discussed how cognition can influence emotions. More specifically in the last lecture we talked about how emotion influences our judgment and decision making. Uh, in that context we have discussed the concept of mood congruent judgment that means our present mood how depending on the balance of your mood uh, how it influences your judgment processes. For example, when we are happy that happy mood could influence our judgment and more we are more likely to judge something as positively and the vice versa. So, we discussed this whole concept of mood congruent judgment and evidences associated with it and then we discussed the diverse possible theoretical explanations uh, why this mood congruent judgment happens. In that context, we have discussed somatic marker hypothesis, effect priming, effect as information and model, effect infusion model. So, these are all the, the detailed aspects we have looked into it in the last lecture. So, today we will be talking about mostly the depression as a disorder which is emotion based disorder. Uh, we will be talking about major depression, types of depression, causes of depression, cognitions in depression and at last uh, some uh, briefly about treatment of depression. So, when we talk about emotion based disorder, we are talking about it is a group of uh, uh, mental health condition which is characterized by some kind of disturbances in emotion. Uh, which could be like you know intense persistent emotional disturbances or experiences. In fact, most of the psychological disorders are connected with some sort of disturbance in emo emotional aspects, most of the psychological disorders. However, some disorders are more specifically very focused to a their emotion based like depression that we will be talking about. So, these disorders can affect uh, a person's ability to regulate. Uh, typically, what happens is uh, in this kind of disorders, people mostly are not able to regulate lot of their emotions. So, emotion becomes maybe exaggerated or persistent in some sense. So, you are not able to kind of regulate them properly and may result in significant distress or impairment in social, occupational and other areas of function. So, when one is not able to regulate emotions or emotions becomes too disturbed and exaggerated. Uh, then obviously it will hamper one's functioning in the day to day life so 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 in that sense it it becomes a disorder some of the examples of emotion based disorders where emotion is at the center of such disorder one is depression that we will be talking today then anxiety disorder that we, this also will be talking in the next lecture so uh, anxiety disorders are a group of disorder characterized by excessive worry too much of anxiety and uh, kind of this anxiety could be free floating uh, may not be sometimes connected to some specific event or object can lead to physical symptoms such as rapid heartbeat sweating shaking and so on then there is a bipolar disorder uh, this is also condition characterized by extreme mood swings between periods of mania and depression so there is a kind of switching between depression and then mania then depression then mania kind of the cycle goes on Mania is means the person become highly elevated, too much of um, uh, increased energy and person may express uh, too much of uh, joy and irritability, too much of activity. So, it becomes more than the normal proportion. So, that is why it is called as a disorder. So, the person suddenly will become extremely active and all kinds of activities and uh, to the extent that it becomes highly irritable and those kind of things the mood can become very agitated and suddenly the person may again go go to the depressed mood where the person can kind of show all the symptoms of depression. So, similarly this two extreme kind of and occurs 
So, that is uh, case of bipolar disorder. Then there is borderline personality disorder is uh, basically condition characterized by very instability in mood relationship and self image the person's whole uh, sense of self image their mood swing and relationships all this becomes very unstable. So, that is called uh, borderline personality disorder. And then there is a post traumatic stress disorder which was earlier categorized under anxiety disorder, but in uh, the latest classification it is uh, it is kind of categorized under trauma and stress related disorders. So, PTSD is a condition that can develop after experiencing or witnessing a traumatic event characterized by symptoms of lot of intrusive thought re experiencing of those traumatic event again and again in terms of flashbacks and those kind of thing avoidance of trauma related uh, uh, stimuli and physiologically very hyper aroused. So, which can at least should remain at least for, for month or more then only it is kind of uh, categorized as uh, PTSD. So, today we will be talking about uh, the depression as a disorder where emotion is at the center of it. So, generally the typical depression is uh, in more technical term it is called as a major depression. So, in general depression is characterized by persistent low mood that lasts for significant period of time without any clear trigger of or even that justifies a severe emotional reaction. So, per persistent low mood sadness and those kind of symptoms we will be discussing in more detail. So, the major aspect of this is persistent low mood or sad, sadness which could last for a significant period of time. Uh, sometimes it can happen without any trigger or any specific reasons. Sometimes something can trigger also, but in many cases it could be without any clear trigger or event to justify such kind of emotional reaction in most of the cases. Even though there is a trigger that cannot be justified for experiencing such uh, low mood and those kind of thing. So, that is called a major depression. Now, depression is a very prevalent disorder, it can affect uh, the diverse people. Some statistics show about 10 percent of general populations are affected by this disorder and in clinical settings and population it could be around 20 percent. Now, let us see the details of the symptoms of this disorder, what kind of uh, symptoms are there in disorders. So, we have uh, diff something called as a DSM in psychology uh, or psychiatric cat categorization of disorder, which is basically diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorder that ca categorizes or classifies different mental disorders. And this has been revised and now it is the fifth version in the latest one. Uh, and uh, we will see what are the criteria in this fifth version of the latest DSM categorization of psychological disorder. So, major depression is diag diagnostic criteria include at least 5 symptoms or more may be there of the symptoms that we will be talking now should be there should be present at least for same 2 week period and it would represent a change from previous functioning. Suddenly, there is a change from previous functioning there is a shift in change uh, in these kind of symptoms. So, at least it should be uh, persistent for 2 weeks period of time and that symptom that we will be discussing now at least 5 of them should be present and more can be there. Now, one of the major thing is that at least one of the symptoms must be there to call something as a major or depression. One is depressed mood and loss of interest, mostly both are there all the time, but at least one has to be there. Uh, but in, mo in generally in uh, most of the depression cases both the symptoms are there. So, we will see what are the list of symptoms and according to this criteria at least 5 of these should be there. The first one is depressed mood as we have said this is very important this is the first thing that that is visible in a depressed patient that the mood is generally depressed nearly every day as indicated by either they may report it to others or one can observe it from their behavior. So, consistently low mood this is the first symptom. Second is uh, marked diminished interest of or pleasure in all al almost activities for most of the day. So, lack of interest, interest goes down in doing activities or day to day activities almost every activities or for most of the day nearly every day which can be reported by the person or one can observe it in their behavior. So, this is also. So, these two are most important mostly both of them are there present or at least one has to be there. The third one is significant weight loss when not dieting or weight gain. So, both 
opposite spectrum can happen. So, that is an interesting thing in, uh, in depression, lot of these symptoms could be in the opposite spectrum. So, either there can be very weight loss or there could be weight gain also, both the spectrum can be there. Fourth is again also another uh, extreme spectrum can be visible, either insomnia or hypersomnia nearly every day. Insomnia means the person is not able to sleep, so lack of sleep, hypersomnia means too much of sleep, too much of sleepiness nearly every day. So, this can manifest in both ways. Fifth one is psychomotor agitation, so retardation nearly every day. So, psychomotor agitation means mental and physical jo activities in terms of body movements and other things, either it will be very high or it will be very low. It could be your speech, how you speak or how you move and how you do activities, either it will be too kind of agitated or it will be too low or too down or when you speak for example, your speech will be very slow, something like that. So, both kind of uh, spectrum can be there. Sixth one is fatigue or loss of energy nearly every day, uh, fatigue or loss of energy, too much of tiredness and those kind of things. Seven is feeling of worthlessness or excessive or inappropriate guilt. There is a sense of worthlessness that you feel your life is useless or you are useless. Whatever it is, a sense of worthiness or sense of self-esteem is kind of goes down very strongly. Uh, so, that feeling could also be very strongly associated in depression. So, it can persistently remain. So, generally people can experience this feeling of worthlessness sometimes because something happens in their life, then, then people generally come back. But in case of depression, it remains persistent. Eighth is diminished ability to think or concentrate or indecisiveness nearly every day. So, lack of concentration obviously, when you are not able to get interest in daily activities, so you will not be able to concentrate also. So, diminish ability to think or concentrate. The ninth one is the recurrent thought of death, uh, recurrent suicidal ideation without specified plan or suicidal attempt or specific plan for communicating or committing suicide. So, so death related thought could be more prevalent when you feel your life is worthless or you are worthless. So, one natural outcome could be lot of death and suicide related thoughts could also be prevalent among this patient, which may lead to suicide or may not. I mean, so that is also possible. So, ideation at the thought level at least, such frequency of so, such thoughts could also increase. So, out of this nine, at least five should be there and the first two are kind of compulsory, at least one is very compulsory. Others at least out of this nine, five should be present to call something as a depression in terms of uh, diagnos diagnostic criteria. Now, it also further says the symptom should cause, all the symptoms should be clinically significant distress, should cause lot of distress in their life and impairment in functioning diverse aspect of functioning, social functioning, occupational functioning and other important areas of functioning. So, all this will impact your functioning in everyday life in terms of your social life, you will not be able to connect with people properly, you will not be able to do justice to your job and so on whatever. So, all this will be impaired and this episode should not be attributed to other uh, physiological effects of substance or other medical condition. So, this thing should not be stimulated by something like somebody taking drugs or some substance or some med effect of medication, then it is not kind of depression because then it is stimulated by those substances. So, that has to be kind of uh, removed before diagnosis something as a depression. So, these are major symptoms or criteria to call something as a depression or a disorder as dis depression. So, clinicians can use diverse ways of kind of class, uh, diagnosis whether somebody has a depression or not, um, they may conduct some by simple conversation with the patient or the client and get the information about the symptoms and may determine that most of the symptoms looks like depression and they kind of confirm it with other aspects also and kind of uh, kind of kind of diagnose with the depression. Clinician may also use structured clinical interviews. So, there are very structured interviews are there where all the structured questions are there that they will ask and according to the response, they will kind of determine whether somebody has a depression or not. Some people also use uh, more informal setting, more research setting, use questionnaires also 
clinician can also use uh, such as back depression inventory which kind of asks people certain symptoms whether they have or not and the person can take and find out whether most of the important symptoms are there or not and based on that they can do some diagnosis based on the scores they get in those questionnaires. So, people can use diverse ways to kind of diagnose uh, depression. So, typically another thing that one has to understand when we talk about depression is that uh, some people may have extreme sadness periodically which is which may not be de depression. So, we should kind of separate sadness sometimes in, uh, in uh, most of life context uh, and it may not be depression. Sadness could be different from depression in many context. So, extreme sadness many time may not be depression if it is normal part of a grieving process. Somebody is uh, has lost somebody in their life or some kind of traumatic event has happened. So, it is a normal process of grieving that somebody will be very sad for some period of time. Now, that is not a depression. It is a normal process of grieving process because somebody is sad, somebody is uh, no, sad because of something has happened. So, very specific trigger is there such as when someone experiences death of a loved one. So, somebody for a period, certain period of time, somebody will be very sad. Now, that is not a depression. It is a, a normal response to grieving process. So, during bereavement, a normal response can look like depression. Symptoms could look like depression in those cases. Uh, but the that is not a depression in this in this uh, particular context where one feels sad regardless of the positive event uh, in this state of sadness can persist for weeks and months in case of uh, grieving processes symptoms could be very similar sometimes there may be brief period of pleasure the, but the deep, deep grief may remain however in some cases uh, the severe grieving process prolonged grief may stimulate depression also it could kind of get converted into depression. It is possible, but not necessarily some if somebody is having uh, the or grieving because of uh, certain event happening in one's life like death of some loved ones. Uh, this is not depression. This is simply a grieving process and it may extend for some times and symptoms may look very similar to depression. But such event if such grieving process remain very long time can stimulate sometime depression. So, that is a different story, but this itself is not a depression. So, are there different types of depression? When we talk about depression, is it like same thing for everybody or there are different categories? So, let us see. Now, this diagnostic and statistical manual criteria of depression that we have discussed, uh, this state that person must experience depressed mood or lack of pleasure is something very clear. This too has to be there nearly every day for at least two weeks. Now, this criteria is kind of very clear cut and this is the most important criteria. However, for other criteria if you see there is a paradox in terms of either this or that could also possible extreme of each can be possible. So, that is a kind of very uh, kind of intrigue, intriguing thing in that sense how can there will be kind of opposites also. So, uh, there seems to be a contradiction among the other diagnostic criteria such as weight gain or maybe weight loss, sleeping too much or sleeping too little psychosomatic retardation or agitation, why this extreme ends are there except the first two which is kind of primary criteria for all the other criteria why there can be extreme opposite symptoms. So, that is an interesting thing and let us see from that can we understand there could be possibly some categories of depression. So, it has been suggested that depression symptoms are associated with opposite end of the same thing, same spectrum there can be opposite thing which may indicate that there, are, there can be existence of two distinct types of depression with different biological and psychological features. So, that was kind of some initial hypothesis that some of the researchers kind of understood tried to look at it. One of the first proposal to differentiate or classify depression into two types was made by Peter Maas in 1975. Uh, Peter Maas in 1975, he suggested that there, there could be type A and type B. So, type A depression and there can be uh, type B depression based on uh, little bit of differences in symptoms. He suggests that the type A depression was linked to deficiency of dopamine in the brain. So, we will be talking about little bit about this neurotransmitter. So, brain has many chemicals are released based on the emotional experiences. So, two chemicals are very strongly connected with the depression, one is dopamine, one is serotonin. 
So, we will be talking little bit about them uh, little later. So, he suggested that the, the type A depression is linked to lack of dopamine or lack or deficiency in the brain dopamine 1 chemical and type B is characterized with deficiency of serotonin. So, there are uh, kind of linked with two, two neurochemicals neuro, uh, um, so chem, uh, ne neurochemicals which one is connected with type A one is connected with type B. So, if his proposal is correct then the two neurochemical patterns should be associated with different symptoms that means type A which is connected with the dopamine should involve insensitivity to reward because dopamine as a uh, neurochemical is connected to the reward system. So, you feel uh, more reward and pleasure out of reward and those things is connected to the dopamine. So, then type A should be connected to insensitivity to reward if there is a lack of dopamine. So, person will not respond to reward and those things and type B should involve intense feeling of sadness which is connected to serotonin. He based on symptoms, he kind of uh, proposed that this could be uh, two possibilities with two neurochemicals. Now, in DSM-4, there were these two uh, typical types of depression that was characterized. One is melancholic depression or atypical depression and atypical depression. So, melancholic is also called typical depression and there is another type called atypical depression. So, typical depression and atypical depression. In DSM-5, they are not exclusively used. Uh, now, some other categories in terms of more major depression and other depressions are used, uh, but this was there in DSM-4. So, uh, this was kind of connected to MARS type A and type B. Uh, so, melancholic or typical depression is similar to type B that MARS talked about is associated with decreased appetite, weight loss, insomnia, and psychomotor agitation. So, one cluster of symptoms according to Mawa's type B and this is typically called as typical depression or melancholic depression. In contrast, atypical depression which is correspond to Mawa's type A is associated with some of this the opposite spectrum of some of this like here depressed uh, decreased appetite, here it is increased appetite, here it is weight loss, here it is weight gain. Here it is insomnia, here it is sleeping too much and here it is psychomotor agitation, here it is psychomotor retardation. So, based on this opposite spectrum of symptom, one is considered as type A, another is type B and similarly this was kind of recognized in uh, classification system also in terms of typical depression and atypical depression. Uh, this is no longer much very uh, formally used nowadays uh, because uh, of kind of uh, not very specific evidences are not there in terms of like that, but this term was very popular and still people use it. So, a study by Keller and Ness found that people reported more fatigue and pessimism after personal failure indicating atypical depression after a kind of failure while they report more crying and sadness after social loss. Uh, probably indicating typical depression. However, the study only examined short term distress of an event not for full blown. So, some studies found that there are possibly different stimulation can lead to different types of disorders. Uh, however, not much very clear cut you know evidences are there in terms of lot of studies or long term studies. Now, distinguishing between these different subtypes of depression can also explain some contradiction in the diagnostic criteria of depression. Uh, studies suggest that at least at least this will uh, resolve some of this diagnostic criteria that why opposite spectrums are there. Suggest that both the serotonin and dopamine system could be involved in depression. One may be linked with one typical and, one, and another may be linked with atypical. And treatments targeting both system can improve symptoms. However, the division between typical and atypical depression is still a matter of debate. Not everybody kind of agrees with it. Uh, as symptoms do not always fit exclusively into one of these subtypes. Many times people have mixed kind of symptoms. So, there people may not find all the time exclusively these symptoms fit and uh, an another symptom always come together. Sometimes it could be mixed also. So, that is why it is still a matter of debate and uh, 
still these terms are used in many contexts, but uh, may not be like exclusively supported by everybody or something like that. Some in individual may have uh, you know symptoms of both the subtypes as I have said. Uh, further research is needed to fully understand obviously differentiate the subtypes of depression and how they relate to underlying biological and psychological factors. Uh, so, obviously, research is evolving and people are trying to understand it more and more, uh, but uh, people generally in DSM 5 the terms like major depressive disorder, persistent depressive disorder, these are the categories used more prominently in uh, the most latest classification system. So, so one is major depressive disorder that typically we discussed in the beginning, it is uh, characterized by another way of categorizing apart from typical and atypical is which is more uh, recent is more kind of accepted in terms of uh, the latest classification system. So, this is called major depressive disorder, it is characterized by one or major depressive episodes. The common usage of the term clinical depression is typically major depression only and all the symptoms that DSM 5 we have discussed are actually the symptoms of uh, major depressive disorders and people can have both the opposite spectrums and kind of together. So, they are not kind of uh, so, this is one cluster of uh, one category of disorder called major depressive disorder. Another uh, type that is also included is called persistent depressive disorder also known as dysthymia. Now, symptoms are very similar with the uh, major depression, but here the difference is that it involves chronic depression lasting 2 years or more. So, when the depression symptoms last for very long time, 2 years or more, then it is called as persistent depressive disorder. Major depression may not be of that long, but persistent uh, depressive disorder could be very uh, time taking and it could last for more than 2 years. So, the term clinical depression usually refers to major depressive disorder and uh, which is most commonly recognized form of depression. So, typically this is the most commonly used term and most of the people actually comes under this category only. However, in DSM 5 persistent depressive disorder is also a new term used to describe what was previously known as dysthymia. It was there in the previous classification, but the name was dysthymia. Uh, or chronic major depression. So, now it is called as a persistent depressive disorder. And now, this classification of uh, the depression has evolved due to the complex and constant changing nature of depressive disorder. Historically, this disease was viewed as a kind of uh, specially classification of this persistent uh, depression was uh, earlier mostly considered as a uh, kind of personality trait, it was abused uh, as a personality uh, state. Historically, this was kind of viewed as a personal depressed personality state, but it is now seen as a disease state rather than a personality disorder. So, uh, some conceptual or theoretical differences are also there. So, when you say it is a disease state means it is a state of disease which can kind of change, it is not, it's not a part of your personality. Earlier, it was considered as a part of your personality. Similar to the other forms of depression, individual with persistent depression disorder may encounter emotions of profound sadness and hopelessness. However, uh, in persistent depression disorder, these symptoms may endure for numerous years. So, that is the different. Earlier, this persistent disorder was mostly considered as a personality disorder. So, so it is a kind of there is a problem in your personality itself. Now, it is considered more as a disease state rather than a part of personality. And Symptoms are very similar, only thing they endure for long time, more than 2 years or 2 or more years. However, it is important to note that this classification and understanding of depression subtype is still a topic of ongoing research and debate and things keep changing in the DSM classification also with the evolving research um, and the criteria and the classification terms are also changed. So, this is kind of latest thing that is uh, there. Now, one of the thing that people also talk about depression is uh, something called as reward insensitivity hypothesis in depression. What is this reward insensitivity hypothesis uh, that is found among pe people with depression? Now, whenever we people think of depression as we have seen most of the symptoms and main major major symptom is often associated with extreme sadness. Uh, however, some researcher argue that the depressed individual the main symptom is lack of pleasure 
rather than sadness. So, they say it the one of the major thing in depression is not just sadness, uh, but main aspect is lack of pleasure. In fact, the first two symptoms are one is about sadness, another is about uh, pleasure. So, one thing is that even more than sadness, it is lack of pleasure that is more dominant in depression. So, this is according to this hypothesis. So, people did uh, different studies which kind of support this idea. One is that uh, in a study where depressed and non-depressed individual watched different types of films like sad films and comedy films. The two groups responded similar to sad and frightening films. So, when they uh, looked at sad films, the response of depressed and non-depressed individual in terms of uh, response was very similar, you know, there was not much difference. So, the response, emotional response was very similar, but the depressed individual uh, reported significantly less amusement while viewing comedies. So, in terms of uh, comedy, which is about uh, positive mood and pleasure, uh, depressed people significantly they reported less enjoyment out of comedy. Uh, even they they even reported mild sadness during comedies. So this is one research that shows that sadness could be kind of very uh, kind of similar to a lot of other people, but they find it difficult to find pleasure out of uh, whatever reward system that they got from the environment. So that could be more important according to this. That doesn't mean sadness is not there, but that lack of pleasure could be more significant in depression according to this hypothesis. In another study by Solen and colleague in 2001 also found that you know depressed and non-depressed women when they were shown a series of pictures with their emotional responses were measured. So, series of pictures were shown to them and their emotional responses were measured along with their facial expression to measure their emotional response. Results showed that both depressed and non-depressed women had similar reaction to the sad picture just like the earlier study. When the sad pictures were shown, the response and facial expression were almost similar to non-depressed people, but depressed women had significantly less response to the pleasant pictures. So, when we see good pictures or any picture that evokes positive emotions, that response is very less in case of depressed individual as compared to non-depressed people, where people can enjoy something much more depressed people are not able to enjoy. So, that reward and pleasure reaction is very less as compared to non-depressed people. So, both the studies show similar finding. So, this is kind of uh, the data uh, which talks about this study in terms of pleasant stimuli and unpleasant stimuli the response was very similar facial expression, but when pleasant stimuli were shown see the depressed people the their intensity of facial expression was very less, they were kind of not not enjoying much in, in terms of the re reaction was very less, but for normal people the reaction was much higher. These participants were also asked to rate how well 12 pleasant and unpleasant word appealed to them when this pleasant and unpleasant pictures and words were presented to them. They were asked specifically to report what they experienced. And when they were unexpectedly asked to recall all the 24, uh, so 12 pleasant, 12 unpleasant words were shown. Initially, they were not told that they should remember, but then unexpectedly they were asked to recall this whatever number of words were presented. They were asked to write them and recall them. Uh, the study found that depressed women remembered fewer of the pleasant words and compared to the non-depressed. So, Pleasant words were more remembered by non-depressed people as compared to depressed people. So, depressed people could very re recall very few pleasant words, while both groups had similar recall of unpleasant words was almost similarly recalled by these people for both depressed and non-depressed, but for pleasant words uh, depressed individual could recall very less. Uh, so, this also shows that some problem with the reward and pleasure aspects getting pleasure out of stimuli is one of the major aspects in depressed people. Another study uh, by Hendricks and Davidson 2000 also, uh, they also did some kind of study where they compared the behavior of depressed and non-depressed participant in word recognition task with and without reward system. So, there was a, they need to recognize some word which was presented earlier and there was a reward system involved in it. 
So, participants are presented with a list of word on a computer screen and then asked to identify the previously presented word in a longer list. So, recognition task is very simple. So, you will be shown a list of word one after the other will be flashed in the screen and then there will be long list of words including some of the words that were presented earlier will be there and then it to recognize which words were presented earlier. So, then it to just recognize not recall. So, this is the similar task was given. However, they included a reward system in the some trials while the participants were simply asked to answer as accurately as possible while on uh, while on others all correct identification earned them a 10 cents. So, in some trials there was no reward and in some trials reward was included where they will get a 10 cent as a reward and there will be no penalty for saying yes or incorrect for incorrect answer if they say yes there will not be any pe penalty, but the more correct answer the more reward system will be there the more reward in terms of for each answer 10 cents will be given. So, the result shows non different participant adjusted their strategy to maximize their chances of earning reward. So, they need to just say yes even if they are it is not right they will not kind of anything will be anything happen to them or there will not be any kind of uh, uh, kind of if they say incorrect also there will not be any penalty. So, there is no harm in saying yes even if you do not know uh, in some answers, but what they found is that this most of the non depressed people they try to earn maximum reward by saying yes more often, but depressed participants fail to do so. So, they were kind of less interested in getting reward. So, reward was not stimulating enough to them. Uh, so, this suggested that they were less responsive to potential rewards. So, most of these studies kind of found uh, the results were in the similar line only. So, this is such that reduced response to reward in depression may be related to dysfunction in the dopamine circuits which we will be talking later. So, dopamine is responsible for this response to reward system probably because of the lack of this uh, neurochemical uh, neuro, uh, neuro neuro chemical in the brain their responsiveness is less. Some studies have reported lower level of dopamine in people with depression and animal studies indicate that manipulating dopamine activity in the reward circuit can produce depression like behavior. So, let us say when you reduce the dopamine in the brain it produces depression like symptoms, but there are many debates and controversies in the in this context we will be looking little later. So, but, but dopamine can play important role in depression, but not necessarily it is very clear cutly the way it is shown in many cases. So, let us see what are the causes. So, now we have discussed about uh, different types of depression and uh, how reward system is involved in the depression system. Let us see what are the possible causes of depression. Now, many depression episodes are triggered by significant losses when something very bad event happens can trigger depression, but not necessarily such as job loss or the end of an important relationship and so on. However, not everyone who experiences such losses become depressed. So, this is not a necessary condition, but many times some negative event can stimulate depression. Uh, Riolo uh, at all 2005 also found that about 10 percent of individuals will experience diagnosed diagnosable depression after major loss. So, not everybody may be 10 15 percent individual will experience uh, uh, a dip, uh, depression means in depression not just sadness, but depression in terms of diagnosable depression. So, there can be variability some people uh, kind of experience or get into full blown depression after major loss some may not. So, there are individual differences. So, the reason for this variability why people are different in terms of response to depression uh, obviously, there can be complex reasoning and other things, but one factor that could kind of differentiate this individual differences is called default mood of the people. So, everybody has default mood emotional kind of set uh, which suggests that we have some pre existing mood which is probably influenced by our genetics. So, mood basically means some people are generally more happier, some people are maybe you know uh, in general they are in temperament wise they are more sad. So, there can be genetic component too. So, so there is a default mood in everybody uh, which may be a significant factor in in responding to life events. How do you respond to life events? So, your that default mood will influence whether after a event how do you come back 
to your life. So, this mood the default mode will be different for different individuals and depending on that our reaction to events also changes or differs. So, one of the major cause of depression could be in the genetics itself where we have discussed that differences in the default mode is could be set by the genetics. So, why people have depression in the first place the reason could be the genetic reason or the contribution of the gene. So, the reason why people have different default mode one of or people react differently it still unclear, but one could one reason could be genetics genetic composition of the person could determine that. So, genetics may play a role in the predisposition of depression as depression tend to run in families. Generally, it has been found depression runs in families. Now, that does not mean everybody will have in that family depression, but generally it was found if somebody is depressed probably somewhere around the families or close people's they are also more likely to have depression. So, it kind of runs in families according to lot of research. Studies have shown that depression is generally more common among biological relatives than adoptive relatives of adopted child who develop depression later in life. So, when a child is adopted by another family it was found they and they later become depressed or a patient of depression it was found their biological parents are more likely to be depressed you know. So, that depression is more correlated with their biological parents and it was not connected to the adopted parents. So, it shows the environment is not genetics is more important in this case because their gene is coming from their biological parents. So, even though they are adopted by another family still their uh, depression the mindset is very similar to their biological parents as compared to their adopted parents. So, the risk of depression is highest for those with depressed uh, female relatives and those whose relatives become depressed early in life. So, uh, probably you know uh, so, some of the depression is a kind of you know uh, could be highest in those with uh, depressed female relatives. So, kind of if female relatives have uh, depression probably that stimulates more depression in uh, especially those relatives who become depressed early in their life could be kind of connected. Serotonin transporter gene uh, could be one of the reasons one candidate gene that may predispose individual in depression. So, some of the gene which kind of kind of controls the secretion of this neuro neurotransmitters or neurochemicals like serotonin uh, could be uh, could kind of diff create this differences of predisposition why some people are more prone to depression as compared to others. So, according to research it seems that gene that predispose individual to depressions are likely to have other effect as well. So, it seems when with depression so many other symptoms are also associated with it. So, it seems probably the gene which uh, which uh, predisposes individuals for depression it kind of increases the risk of depression it also has other functions not just depression is the function it seems to create other cluster of other symptoms not just depression. So, these are like the families that have history of major depression are also more likely to have history of alcohol dependence substance abuse, antisocial personality disorder, bulimia, uh, it is a kind of eating disorder, panic disorder, migraine headaches, attention deficit disorder and so on. It seems some of these are automatically comes with uh, the depression especially when it runs in the family lot of other things are associated with depression this also comes with depression not necessarily every time it will happen, but it is more likely to come this kind of symptoms are also uh, other other issues and problems also comes up with the depression. So, it could be probably that same gene that predisposes people for depression has also impact on this. So, these are kind of possibilities you know it is not necessarily every time this will happen. So, if someone has a relative with any of this disorder the risk of developing same disorder uh, or others is higher than the average. So, its probability is higher. So, that does not does not mean it will happen only in, in terms of probability uh, the research is talking about. Gender also seems to play a role in how this predisposition man is manifest within a family. Uh, gender can also play like on an average more men tend to have issues with alcohol with the depression, men tend to have more issues with alcohol while more women tend to have problem with depression you know. Uh, so, 
some gender differences could be also be there in terms of depression seems to be more among women as compared to men alcohol issues are more among men as compared to women which may have also maybe connection with the cultural issues and other things also so it is possible that the uh, underlying genetic predisposition is the same for both issues so it seems but one could manifest more in male and one could manifest more in female so uh, but could be maybe underlying predisposition is same now let's see about what we have talk, talked about earlier many instances or references of dopamine and serotonin we have seen let's see very briefly about what are these actually uh, which have been linked to depression many time in many research so serotonin uh, and dopamine these are neurochemicals you know neurotransmitters they, they are also called as so kind of release in the brain and body uh, in reaction to different emotional experiences so serotonin is closely related to mood regulation emotions and overall well being so it is often referred to as feel good neurotransmitter so when uh, serotonins are released in the system uh, we feel generally a positive emotion arises we feel good so it's, it's a kind of happy feeling will arises or whenever we experience happiness probably these are released more so all the emotions will be associated with some release of this neurotransmitter uh, so one prevailing theory about serotonin is that depression is that there is a deficiency of serotonin in depressed individuals so they are they are not able to feel happiness or the mood becomes low because of lack of serotonin so this is one hypothesis so this theory suggests that a lower level of serotonin in the brain contributes to the development of depression so this lower level as compared to a normal people could contribute to depression uh, many antidepressant medication that are given actually works on this principle only such as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors ssri most of this uh, the pills that are given by psychiatrists actually works on that they work by increasing the availability of serotonin in the brain so basically this uh, medicine stimulates uh, more serotonin in the brain so that it changes your mood so most of this medication works on this principle so it's important to note that the relationship between serotonin level and depression is not as straightforward as one's thought and cause of depression could be multifaceted so this is one hypothesis where in some cases this could be connected but the research has not found very consistent evidences still you know uh, the cause of depression could be multifaceted this could be one of the aspects that two people have found the different dimensions to it so it's not very clear cut finding but it could contribute to depression in some cases dopamine is another neurotransmitter that is associated with reward system of the brain that when we get something reward pleasurable things that happens we experience some motivation and pleasure so the motivate to do something because there is a reward to it comes from dopamine and pleasure pathways it is involved in motivation pleasure and experience of rewards so we like to get reward and we feel happiness and motivated to do something when we get reward it is because of the effect of the dom- dopamine so so dopamine is not directly linked to depression as serotonin uh, but dopamine does play a role in symptoms of uh, some depression particularly the context of pleasure from the reward which is also called anhedonia which is inability to experience pleasure from activities so that reward insensitivity hypothesis that we talked about could be linked to dopamine because dopamine is related to getting pleasure from reward and if the dopamine is less in your brain probably one will not get pleasure out of reward so reward may not stimulate such kind of individuals so in some cases depression there may be imbalances in dopamine levels of dis- and uh, or dysfunction in the brain's dopamine receptors but again it cannot be generalized to everybody in some cases it could be the case this could lead to reduced motivation low energy level lack of interest in previously enjoyed activity which are the common symptoms of depression so it is possible that dopamine also plays very important role and lot of this medication actually works on that sometimes uh, they are effective sometimes they are not effective depending on many other causes associated with the depression so dopamine and serotonin are certainly involved in the development and regulation of mood their roles in mood is very clear their roles in depression is however more nuanced and uh, not very clear cut and straight forward uh, so obviously it's much more complex and not even fully understood even today more research will kind of clarify but 
obviously they have their role in in the depression and some medication works because of these principles now depression can be also associated with past experiences according to some theories our past experiences may increase the vulnerability of depression in response to negative experiences uh, research, uh, research is also shows women are more likely to experience certain type of negative experiences such as childhood sexual abuse which may increase their risk of depression so some that is why probably you know um, all the women's uh, their cases of depression could be more among women's because probably their experiences with life because of the gender issues they are more likely to experience negative uh, experiences in life which could kind of contribute to depression several studies have found that women have that have mm, who have experienced childhood sexual abuses are more likely to experience adult depression and suicidal behavior after experiencing such stressful life event so these studies are also limited by the fact that the individuals who have experienced childhood sexual abuse may also experience other negative experiences such as poverty abuse and so on so obviously so different negative experiences in life could contribute to depression and uh, probably uh, in some cases of women those there may be multiple of such factors so researcher even uh, found twin studies uh, uh, reported different level of childhood as sexual abuse uh, these studies found that the twins who reported sexual abuse had a greater risk of depression and suicide attempts than their non abused twins uh, although both the twins had a higher risk of depression than the general population so uh, some of these such events could exaggerate the risk of depression so uh, is overall family environment may predispose individuals to depression but childhood sexual abuse adds to that depression so some of the specific events may contribute to depression much more and overall whatever the environment we are put in during childhood all this can also contribute to depression apart from genetic reasons now let us see some of the cognitive aspects of depression means what are the thought processes what happens at the thought level when one experiences depression uh so in depression there are many changes happens at the thought level belief level and so on so those are called as cognitions specifically individual may experience feeling of uh, sadness when they perceive themselves to be powerless or lacking control in negative situations furthermore if they have a general sense of helplessness or hopelessness they may be more likely to experience depression so at the thought level also what you think or another major shift that happens in depression or cause depression how you think mostly when we think powerless lack of control in your life uh, when you have sense of helplessness hopelessness all this could be associated with sense of depression cognitive theories of depression focus on how this negative events and beliefs and attitudes contribute to sadness and depression mostly they focus on thought level rather than genetics and other thing obviously they have their own contribution uh, this theory is generally suggests that individual with depression tend to have distorted negative views about themselves so generally most of the people who have depression they have a distorted negative views of themselves their experiences and their futures so generally they have distorted means they are not realistic something negative happened and they exaggerated those uh, impact of those events and they think their life is uh, worthless and so on so those kind of distortion is very strong in depression patient one of the most prominent uh, theories is basically back's cognitive theory he is one of the most prominent person who did uh, research on cognition of of depressed individuals or depression he uh, one of the main th- findings or main aspects of his theory is back's cognitive theory is that people with depression actually has these things they have a negative and irrational thought about themselves about the world about their future so these are called as cognitive triad so ye teen three aspects people have very negative persistent attitude towards these things so they have negative attitudes about themselves about the world in general which includes other people and their future so they have negative attitudes towards it or negative views about them so these are called cognitive triad and this could contribute to depression or people when they become depressed probably such kind of thought processes happen both can happen so according to this theory depressed individual tend to interpret events in a very negative way which leads to feelings of hopelessness and helplessness so obviously if you think you are worthless this whole world is not dependable your future is dark 
the sadness and helplessness hopelessness all this is bound to happen another aspects in cognitive cognition of uh, depression is that explanatory style people how they explain things in their life is different so it's connected to those negative cognitions now it refers to individuals habitual way of explaining so we explain things obviously it can differ, differ from person to per, uh, situation to situation but sometimes people have a habitual way of explaining things similar pattern they will look everything in every whatever happens in their life they, their interpretation will be very similar way so that is habitual way of explaining or interpreting events and experiences in their life how they explain things that happens in their life sometimes it becomes habitual so those are called explanatory style so it becomes a style of looking at things so it can be broadly categorized into some people have a very pessimistic style of explaining things some people have optimistic style of explaining things mostly depression is associated with pessimistic kind of explanation what is this pessimistic explanation style generally how they explain it uh, a pessimistic explanation in involves internal explanation means individuals with pessimistic explanatory style tend to attribute negative events to internal personal factors so they will see if something bad happens they will say it is because of their their own re, own the reason is they themselves personal factors so believe that the cause of these events are themselves such as their abilities personality or internal flaws so something bad happened because i am not good at it so they will kind of find put themselves in the center of it sometimes things can happen because of many other reasons which is outside of themselves but they will say it is because of me my inability my flaws things are happening so that's an internal kind of aspect is there second is stable their explanations are very stable in a sense uh, their negative events they will kind of explain it as an enduring stable over time so they believe that some something bad happens it will continue to be a problem so sometimes you can the things happen in a short time I, I i will try to change it in the next time or something like that but they will make it more stable if something has happened badly so it will it is impacts my whole life for a long time so that stability aspect is there then there is a global aspect means they generalize it to everything this style of attribution negative events to global factors affecting many aspects of their life for instance if they fail in a test they might think they are incompetent in all areas of their life so if they fail in one aspect of things like let's say if they fail in one interview they will say i will never be able to succeed in other interviews so it's like they make it very generalized thing one event one thing happened and they say my life is worthless because i failed in one thing so that they are defining their life from one aspect to every aspect of their life so that's like global aspect so pessimistic explanatory styles include these factors optimistic explanatory style is just opposite to that they will have uh, attribute negative things to situational things some most of the time so it may happen because some you failed because so many other things or luck was not on your side or some other people were not supporting some some kind of factors that would, which will not make them feel bad some kind of explanations are also people find it they also see it as an unstable thing believing that the situation can change and improve over time something so next time i will try again uh, or they find it more specific if they fail in one thing they will see this is failure in this thing only not every aspect of my life so there is a difference in their uh, explanatory style so depression is generally found a connection with the explanatory style most of the depressed patient they develop this kind of pessimistic explanatory style uh, and uh, which could be one of the pattern of their thought processes so this could contribute to depression another aspect is also found that in uh, people with depression they have something called as a learned helplessness which was uh, kind of proposed by martin seligman in 1967 uh, he which is associated with giving up and avoidance symptoms people give up because of some past history history that has happened with them uh, this learn helplessness occurs when individual repeatedly experience negative uncontrollable situations so let's say in the past somebody has experienced series of negative events and they could not change those events something bad happened happened three four times but they could not change it now this led leads people to develop a mindset that i will not be able to change anything in future or if something happens similarly again the person will not try even because he has developed this whole helplessness that i tried few times in the earlier i failed so even if things change now now maybe it is possible to change the, the person will not even try to change it because they, this is a learned helplessness 
So, this is what happens learned helplessness occurs after an individual repeatedly experience negative uncontrollable situation and become passive and unmotivated and stay that way even after the environment changes or success is possible. So, even when success is possible they will not try to do it again simply because of their past repeated failures or whatever negative experiences. So, that is called as a learned helplessness. Many research shows that a lot of human beings particularly people with the depression probably uh, or this may lead to depression or this is uh, kind of visible in lot of depressed people. So, here individual believes that efforts are futile. Why should I even put effort because I am going to fail again. So, this is what it develops in the mindset. So, people when they say uncontrollable and undesirable events again some multiple times they perceive a lack of control. They feel I cannot control this thing. Now, it is not in my hand. There is no point in trying it again. So, this leads to a generalized helpless behavior. So, it may contribute to depression and other anxiety disorders. So, it kind of a uh, lot of studies shows uh, a lot of depression could be associated with this concept. With this negative concept uh, other thoughts most of these things are explanatory style is also connected to something called as unrealistic or irrational beliefs people have in mostly the depressed people. They hold unrealistic expectations about what they need to accomplish or become in order to set feel satisfaction. So, along with this pessimistic explanatory style they have unrealistic and irrational beliefs also. For instance, they may believe that failing something diminishes their worth as a person. So, if you fail in something, they will believe that it is that I am an worthless person. So, as one failure, they connect it to their whole individuality. So, this is a kind of irrational belief. Failing in one thing, how can it lead to your whole life as a failure? Not possible. This is irrational. There is no logic in it. One event and how can every li whole life is connected to failure in one life, one, one event to failure of whole life. So, this is called irrational belief. So, these beliefs can lead to them interpreting even minor setbacks in their life to inadequacy and may quickly become discouraged as a result. So, this tendency will make them more prone to get depressed and sad with even minor uh, setbacks in their life. So, this lack of motivation and activity is a hallmark of depression. So, these are very important characteristics that are visible in the mind of depression. So, this dysfunctional irrational beliefs are closely related to pessimistic explanatory style that you talked about, but they are even more strongly related to depression than even explanatory style. So, this unrealistic belief and uh, irrational beliefs are very strongly found among depression, patient with depression. Another thing that is remuneration is kind of uh, is also very prominent among depressed people uh, that is remuneration is a tendency to repeatedly and excessively think about same thoughts concerns and problems often in a circular unproductive manner. So, something happens negatively you are thinking again and again and again and so series of thoughts multiple thoughts your mind is flooded with thoughts unproductive thoughts. So, so you are focusing only on the problems and circular. So, sometimes this can happen automatically to almost every individuals it can happen, but it can remain for a long time for some people. So, remuneration generally happens when negative thing happens in our life you know too much of thoughts and the whole mind is flooded with thoughts. So, people dwells on distress symptoms, negative emotions without making progress. So, such thought processes are unproductive because you are not going anywhere just focusing on the problem and uh, you are circulate so thoughts are circul cir circulating one after the other without really going anywhere reaching any solution. So, these are called remunerative thoughts. So, remuneration can uh, can have connection to a lot of things including uh, especially when failure happens, when you have some regret for the past, when there is a conflict between individuals or you are worrying about your future. Remuneration can happen. Almost everybody can experience remuneration that is okay, but when it becomes prolonged and uh, too much that can create problem. Studies have shown that individuals who engage in remunerations are more likely to develop depression. So, depression could be connected to remuneration too much of remuneration and uh, research indicate that women are mo more diagnosed with depression as compared to men. One possible reason is that generally women are found to remunerate more as compared to male. These are general findings exceptions could be there. Uh, more specifically women who remunerate excessively and have low masteries over the situation are more likely to develop depression. So, remuneration does not cause depression as such, but it may be connected to the 
early symptoms of depression. Evidence indicate that teaching individual how to avoid remuneration can help prevent depression. So, intervening depression sometimes can prevent depression or reduce depression. That means, it is associated with depression, but it may not directly cause depression. So, at the last we will talk about what are the some of the possible treatment that people do. These are just for indications. It does not mean you can um, uh, treat yourself based on this information. This is just what are the possible treatments available. So, majority of depression cases are treated with mostly talk therapy, uh, psychotherapies, medications are also used sometimes or sometimes combination of these two. So, this is a generally accepted uh, trend of uh, kind of treatment. A lot of uh, studies shows that effectiveness of both medication and talk therapy are generally effective or combination is used in many cases. Uh, some may prefer uh, one over the other depending on their preferences. Some may use both approach approaches. So, there are various approaches therapies used to assist people in coping with depression among this cognitive therapy because as we have seen one of the major problem with the depression patient is their, their whole thought processes get distorted or there is a pattern develops which is very pessimistic. So, intervention to their thought processes or changing their thought process is one of the most important uh, therapy that is done for depressed people which is called cognitive therapy. So, they try to change their thought processes. So, these are called cognitive therapies and these are found to be very effective in altering dysfunctional biases and explanatory style of individual with depression. So, it may take time, but this is how they are trained to understand how their thinking is not rational and slowly slowly they try to change them. Therapies try to change their thought processes which can improve their emotional aspect also. So, in recent year there have been many significant use of antidepressant medications are also used in extreme cases. Then patients are also given uh, medications. In some cases medications will be required. Uh, when prescribed and monitored properly this, this uh, medication can also effectively work in many cases. Most of these antidepressant drugs as I have already mentioned they are actually work on increasing the levels of serotonin and dopamine in the brain. Because the one of the basic idea is that they are, there is a deficiency of this neurotransmitter in the brain in case of depression. So, some medications are given to increase their level which can in many cases could improve their depression and may not improve in all cases. Some antidepressant like uh, Prozac primarily affect serotonin uh, means they increase the serotonin level allowing the release of serotonin where it can activate uh, such medications are called SSRIs or serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So, basically they will increase the level of or they keep force the serotonin level to remain in the brain for mo more time. Some work with blocking the serotonin transporter. So, in that way also it is increasing the level. Some also increases the dopamine level prolonging the effect of both the transmitter. So, on the other hand some depression only act on dopamine some uh, important uh, some people may respond differently depending on what is the cause of depression. So, some medication works with dopamine, some works with the serotonin, some may works with both um, and all this combination can work for some people depending on the causes, causal factors. So, it is a complex disorder and it may need multiple interventions. One thing may not work. So, according to various studies uh, most antidepressant drug increases serotonin activity with the hypothesis the serotonin, uh, but this is not fully understood and it is not kind of fully supported everywhere. However, research has found that depressed individual often have abnormalities of the serotonin transporter protein. Some serotonin connection has been found you know is there in most of the depression cases and uh, some gene variant related to these proteins are associated with better response. So, in case of traditional treatment such as talk therapy and medication if they fail in extreme cases, sometimes some people also use electroconvulsive therapy or ECT for a brief period of time or some sometimes people use sleep deprivation temporarily uh, as a last resort. So, these are not generally used, these are not even popularly used. In as a last resort, sometimes this kind of things also work. So, in ECT people ba basically send some electric current to the brain in sleep deprivation temporarily altered some brain chemistry. So, by sending some electric current sometimes also it changes brain chemistry. So, sometimes it works for some people. However, these treatments are not commonly used and are typically reserved for some severe cases and these are done. 
Some uh, research suggests that some lifestyle changes can also improve mood and prevent depression in some cases. Uh, it includes exposure to moderate amount of sunlight and spectrum of light. Some depression are associated with seasonal changes and affect seasonal changes and it may be related to light. So, sunlight exposure could be uh, good in terms of specially you know can be helpful moderate amount of sunlight, regular exercise such as jogging, brisk walking all this can also improve mood and prevent depression in many cases regular exercises such as jogging and walking, dancing and so on. Maintaining regular sleep schedule is also important in reducing the risk of depression. So, these are all related to improving your mood and preventing depression to happen. That does not mean these are treatment, these are more like preventive state which can help you to prevent depression or sadness in your life. So, these are not like, like you know factors that can prevent depression completely, but these are like facilitative factors which can help you along with other things. So, seeking professional help remains the most effective way of dealing depression when it is a kind of major depression or proper diagnosable depression. So, with this I stop here. So, this is a uh, nutshell about depression as a disorder. It is a very complex disorder. We do not know more many of aspects of it. Whatever uh, is known, some of this research I have uh, just put it here. So, we will talk about another disorder in the next lecture. Thank you. Thank you.